I think that's the other thing that people don't particularly understand about fraudsters. They treat this as a business. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast. This is the show where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me, as always, is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hi, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, Carol Terrio returns. She's got an interview with Jay Bennett of Signified. They are a firm that is trying to use artificial intelligence to fight romance scams. Oh, good for them. But first, a message from our sponsors, Know Before. Step right up and take a chance. Yes, you there. Give it a try and win one for your little friend there. Which were the most plausible subject lines in phishing emails? Don't be shy. Were they A, my late husband wished to share his oil fortune with you, or B, please read important message from HR, or C, a delivery attempt was made, or D, take me to your leader. Stay with us and we'll have the answer later, and it will come to you courtesy of our sponsors at Know Before, the security awareness experts who enable your employees to make smarter security decisions. And we are back. Joe, I'm going to kick things off for us this week. I've got a story from the folks at CoFence, and the uh, article is titled, This Credential Fish Masks the Scam Page URL to Thwart Vigilant Users. Mm. This is by Milo Salvia uh, from CoFence's Fishing Defense Center. And the folks at CoFence have been tracking a phishing campaign that looks to gather credentials from Stripe. And Stripe is an online payment platform. Okay. They handle billions of dollars uh, for folks. And so what happens is you get an email from someone that says it's from Stripe support. Right. And it tells them that there are details associated with your account that are invalid and that you need to take immediate action. Otherwise, your account will be placed on hold. Hmm. Now, if you are an online retailer or something, or you rely on your Stripe service, this would get your attention. Immediately. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you follow the link and that takes you to a page that looks just like the Stripe login page. Right. A couple of interesting things to note here. So this page looks exactly like Stripe's page. So it asks for your email and your password. Mm -hmm. And once you enter them, it asks for your bank account number and your phone number. Hmm. All of these are things that would not be out of the ordinary for you to enter in your interactions with Stripe. But after you enter in your bank account and your phone number, it pops up a window that says wrong password, enter again, and takes you to the actual Stripe login page. Ah. Which looks exactly like the page you were just at. Right. So the notion being that once you see this wrong password message, you will enter in your password again. You'll think, oh, I must have just mistyped it or something like right. that. You'll, you'll be, log in successfully. You'll move on to the actual Stripe site and you will be looking at the URL saying this is Stripe. And that, very clever, I think. Yeah, yeah. So in the meantime, they have gathered up your email, your password, your bank account, and your phone number. All very useful information uh, if they want to come at you. Now, another interesting thing about this particular attack is, as the title of this article says, they're using very basic HTML functionality to try to hide the URL. We've talked about many times how it's always a good idea if you're on your desktop to hover over a link. When you hover over a link with your mouse, the URL will usually pop up yep. and it'll show you where you're going to be, show you the actual URL for where you're going. Correct. So for example, if you think that when you hover over this, it should say you're going to Google and instead it says it's visiting malwarethieves.com, you know, don't click through to that. Right. Well, built into HTML's A tag, one of the fundamental uh, <laughs> building blocks of HTML. It's A for anchor. Right, and right. Th that goes all the way back to when this was just used at CERN. Mm, right. When HTML okay. was just used at CERN, they called it an anchor to another document. When you specify in an A tag, you can specify the URL and then you close the first A tag, right, with a, with a closing bracket. Right. And then you can put any text you want in there and it can even look like another URL. Then you say less than slash A 
greater than, and that's the closing tag for the entire A tag. That's how HTML works. If anybody out there is still awake after I've explained <laughs> that. Um, let me but, get my weed whacker, Joe, <laughs> right. uh, to get that's us right, out of- I'm down uh, in the weeds. Yeah, let me uh, just fire that puppy up here. But uh, basically, that's that's the technical way of how you put in some text and have the URL point to anything you want in, in HTML. Right, and, and also within the anchor tag is the ability to put in a title. Correct. And so what that allows you to do is sort of take over what pops up when someone hovers over that link. Correct. So instead of the URL popping up, which is the default behavior, if you put in information for a title, that will pop up instead. Mm -hmm. And so that could be a different URL, which right. could mask the fact that this is going to a, a malicious URL. Yep. And another thing, uh, as I was looking into this, just a good reminder that it's harder to do these things on mobile devices than it is on desktop because you can't really hover with a like you can with a mouse right. on a touch interface. On iOS, if you press and hold on a link, it'll pop up and it'll give you the, the actual link. destination. The link. actual destination. Right. There's actually Apple actually changed the functionality in iOS 13, which is the newest version. It'll give you a preview of the destination page, and it's actually an extra click to get to being able to see the URL. So. In some ways, for security, it's kind of a step backwards because it's harder to see the actual URL. I can see the utility of getting a preview of the page you're going to. I wonder from a security point of view, is it dangerous to generate this preview of yeah, the page you might question. be going to. If it is a malicious link, something's rendering that page. Right. In this case, it wouldn't have helped you unless you actually took the time to look through the URL, yeah. right? Because it would have yeah. looked just like the Stripe login page. On Android, how do you preview a, a URL? Well, you can't same really thing? get a visual preview, but if you do the same thing, you long press, a window pops up that says, do you want to open this in a, another tab, in an incognito tab? You want to save it? You want to share it? But mm -hmm. up at the top, is the actual text of the URL. I see. So you can actually read the URL just by long pressing on, on it on Android. All right. Well, in terms of recommendations to protect yourself against this type of thing where they're trying to get your Stripe uh, credentials, I suppose in terms of vigilance, I mean, anytime someone's asking for anything that's financially related. Right. Vigilance. And if you have the capability, two-factor authentication. Oh, um, right. That, yeah. Because yeah, that you, would work here. Mm -hmm. That would really save your butt if, if you if you actually gave them your username and password. They still wouldn't be able to get in. Yeah. Because yeah. they wouldn't have your, your second factor. Yeah. All right. Well, that's my story this week. Joe, what do you have for us? Dave, I have something for personal experience. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not happy about it. All right. Last week, I sent my boss, uh, Dr. Tony DeBora, a progress report. Yeah. And Tony replied to me and said, this looks great. Let's meet up next week after the staff meeting on Tuesday. And I said, fine, that's great. Yeah. On Monday, I had lunch with Tony. We were having a meeting with uh, Dr. Lee, our technical director, and somebody from industry. And after we got back from lunch a little bit later in the afternoon, around 3.55, I get an email with a subject line, quick request. Mm -hmm. And the only thing in the email was the word available, followed by a question mark, and then a dash, Anton Deborah, because that's Tony's actual name, executive director. And quickly I replied, sure. Right? Yeah. And I grab my notebook and a pencil and I head downstairs to Tony's office only to find it dark. And I'm wondering, where's Tony? And I see a coworker of mine and I go, where's Tony? And she says, he left it too. Did you get that email? And I'm like, oh, uh, uh, dang. Uh, so I Joe. grab my phone and I really quickly, I look at the email and sure enough, it does not come from Tony's actual email. It comes from a Gmail account that is set up to emulate Tony's email. I didn't check the email, right? Wow. So I responded to the guy and uh, they got me, Dave. They got me. <laughs> they got me with a fish. And Oh, for shame, Joe, for shame. I was so angry with myself and embarrassed <laughs> oh. at this. We've been getting a lot of these at, at the office recently where they're sending out messages from like department heads when they're just trying to get gift cards. So uh -huh. if yep. this would have gone on, this would have been, you know, hey, I, I'm at this meeting. I need you to go buy me some gift cards. Right. And my plan was, OK, I'm going to extract my vengeance from these guys. Right. I'm going <laughs> to. Okay. We, we talked a couple months back about Sean who just hit the uh, quick reply buttons on Gmail. Because Gmail, if you have an Android phone and you receive an email and you click reply, it gives you like three options to quickly reply that are sentences that sound like they're cogent responses. Right. But 
it just takes a button click to do it. And I was like, I'm going to do this. But alas, our network security team, our operational security team blocked the address. So I, <laughs> They were I, one step ahead of you. That's the right thing to do. But yeah. I never got any further emails from this person or people. Now, to add insult to injury, what, what you're saying here is that your coworker had gotten the same email had gotten a similar email months ago. Right? Oh, and, and that person did not fall for it. No, well, I, he, <laughs> I, I don't know that I would have fallen for it. <laughs> he knew right away that it was a scam. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I guess he didn't host a podcast about social engineering, no, does I guess, he? I guess not. <laughs> I guess not. Okay. <laughs> uh, I like to think that if this had gone on, that the moment somebody replied to me and said, hey, I'm in a meeting right now and I need you to do me a favor, I would have clued in on it. Yeah, um, I suspect you probably would have. Right. <laughs> well, but you also think about if, what if Tony worked in a different building or if you were working from home that day? In other words, you were able to, you grabbed your stuff and went down to your boss's office. Right. That was your, dark. yeah, that was your impulse. But right. for a lot of people, that wouldn't be a possibility. Right. You're 100% correct. There was a, a, a real physical stop that helped me out here, aside from maybe recognizing a scam when I see it, but there was actually an oddity that made me stop and go, huh, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And somebody else asking me, oh, did you get the email that looked like it came from Tony? <sighs> <laughs> oh, Joe. Well, like we say, it can happen to anybody. Yeah, it happened to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hasn't happened to me in a while, but it has happened to me. Look, hey, it could happen to anybody. No, nobody is immune to this. Right. They will get everybody with something. If they, they want you bad enough, they will figure out a way to get you. They got me at just the right time, right? Mm -hmm. They hit me with this email right at the right time. The week before, Tony had said, let's have a meeting. That day, I had had lunch with Tony and thought maybe he wanted to have this meeting now mm -hmm. and uh, on Monday afternoon rather than Tuesday afternoon. I because see. Because it was a, you know, a meeting of opportunity. So it was just the perfect confluence of all these things that made me go, oh, Tony wants to see me right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go downstairs. So Joe, what did we learn from this, Joe? What, what, well, what are I the guess, lessons? <laughs> I guess we learned that when you get a very terse email unsolicited from your boss, that you should look at the from email address because that would have been all it would have taken to get me to recognize it as a scam. Hmm. Of course, I would have immediately replied, sure. <laughs> If you knew it was a scam, if I knew you it was a scam, I would have been like, "All right, let's play." The game is afoot. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I guess uh, good lesson for all of us. Yep. Uh, and, and you'll you'll be a little more careful now. Or at least, <laughs> well, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I like to think that I'm always careful, but this time, this time they got me. Yeah. I'm all right. Embarrassed. Well, I'm glad you're willing to share, and that's the thing. Lots of that, people well, you are know, too embarrassed to share. We have that... talked about people on this show who have lost. Thousands and thousands of dollars right. who have had the courage to come forward and share their experience. Yes. Right. How little of an impact this has had on my life, aside right. from just my emotional feeling of, of embarrassment and anger myself for falling for it. I am willing to take that exchange and willing to share my story as well. All it cost you was your dignity. All it cost me was my <laughs> dignity. That's right. <laughs> it's time to move on to our catch of the day. Our catch of the day comes from uh, actually a friend of mine on Facebook. His name is Rich, and uh, he is someone who enjoys toying with scammers. Uh, evidently, for whatever reason, he gets a lot of these via text. Uh, and these are folks who are, I think, are trying to um, connect with him for some dating. He is a single guy, and uh, so, you know, I guess he's on, on a list somewhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> he might be someone who's looking for companionship or relationships. So uh, when he senses that he's got a scam, he likes to keep them going. And here is the story. I will play the part of the scammer, and you can play the part of Rich. Okay. Hey, good morning. Hey, it's nearly afternoon in the UK. It's 10 a.m. here. Ah. What's the time there? Five. So why are you trying to match with someone in the U.S.? I'm willing yo move there anytime soon as soon us I graduate from school. Uh... So someone with a different picture showed up with the exact same number to text. I don't understand the point. I'm willing to move there as soon as I graduate. Sorry, I don't get you. And I would have to pay for your travel? No, I have money and am from the rich. Uh, why would two different women on Match have the same number to text to? Sorry, why are you sounds fishy? Is anything wrong? I don't know. I am very new to this. Sorry, you are getting me confused. Two women... Same number, same method of texting. That's pretty straightforward. Well, I know nothing about this. Sorry. Okay. 
Are you from the UK originally? Yes, please. Because your English is a little off. For instance, in English, you don't say you are from the rich. You would say you are rich or your family is rich. Just FYI for the next person you try this on. And you don't say you are getting me confused. You would say you are confusing me or I'm getting confused. Does that help? Okay, thanks, you. No S. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> your friend is trying to give this person a, uh, a lecture in English. Yeah, well, so, you know, he's helpful. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, not only is he eating up the uh, the scammer's time, but it's a, just a little cultural exchange there to, to try to help them brush up on their English. Right, this so. is not a native English speaker. Nope. All right, well, that is our catch of the day. Coming up next, Carol Terrio returns. She's got an interview with Jay Bennett. He is from Signified. They are a firm that is looking to use artificial intelligence to help fight romance scams. But first, a word from our sponsors, Know Before. And what about the biggest, tastiest piece of fish bait out there? If you said, A, my late husband wished to share his oil fortune with you, you've just swallowed a Nigerian print scam. But most people don't. If you chose door B, please read important message from HR. Well, you're getting warmer, but that one was only number 10 on the list. But pat yourself on the back if you picked C. A delivery attempt was made. That one, according to the experts at Know Before, was the number one come on for spam email in the first quarter of 2018. What's that? You picked D, take me to your leader? No, sorry, that's what space aliens say. But it's unlikely you'll need that one unless you're doing the day the Earth stood still at a local dinner theater. If you want to stay on top of fishing's twists and turns, the new school security awareness training from our sponsors at Know Before can help. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash fish test. And we are back. Joe Carroll Terrio recently had the opportunity to speak with Jay Bennett. He is from a company called Signified, and they're using artificial intelligence to fight romance scams. Here's Carroll Terrio. So at some point in our lives, if we are lucky, we find love. And prior to this, a lot of our free time is spent, well, seeking it out. And those of us with grayer hair out there will remember when flirting just consisted of a shy smile across the library aisle. But some of the younger listeners out there may have only experienced online connections. And let's face it, the reality is that today's dating world, whether you're an old pro or a newbie on the scene, largely begins online. And it ain't all pretty. There are scammers out there who kickstart their attack where it hurts the most, the heart. And there's this recent New York Times article which reported on a woman's suicide following her discovery that she had been first romance scammed and then financially duped to the tune of $100,000. Yeah, you heard that correctly. And yeah, it is a shed load of money. Now, I've invited the VP of Operations and Corporate Development, Bennett from Signified. This is a company that uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to detect and block these types of attack. And I wanted Bennett to walk us through this scam to help us understand what we can do to protect ourselves. Thanks, Bennett, for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I think there are two things from your intro that I would like to tease out. The idea of old pros and new people trying to find love online. And actually what we find is that the scammers are very good at finding both of those people in one. So we're typically going after elderly folks who are re-entering the dating world. It's almost someone who is not used to this space and then trying to find love and then trying to do it online for the first time. That seems to be where people are going after. These are becoming increasingly common. They're doubling in count and more than quadrupling in dollar amount. And so fraudsters are finding a lot of success with this type of attack. And it was already the number one, as reported to the FTC and the FBI. Gee, because I got to tell you, if my own husband of mur, mur, mur years asked me for a hundred you know, thousand bucks, I can assure you both my eyebrows would shoot up pretty darn quickly. So how does an individual part with such a significant amount of money without ever having met the person in real life? Difficult to answer because it's so personal to every single situation. People who have $100,000 lying around that they could maybe wire to someone because, you know, they need a for hospital bills, they needed to pay for a visa. It's a pretty small population. 
the first thing to really understand is that these fraudsters are putting in work and they see someone as a target. They identify someone. We have seen in our you know, interviews with the people who have been scammed that they're spending a minimum of a year building up rapport with these people. It doesn't even need to be romance. It could be up to three years of a friendship. And then all of a sudden, a really dear friend to you says, oh, I've you know, been totally destroyed by this accident. I, I can't pay my hospital bills. Now I can't get out of the country because the, you know, the debtors are coming after me. It, this whole scenario sounds pretty fantastical. I like the way that you frame it up. If my husband asked me for this, what would I say? But un- unfortunately, you probably have a much stronger support network than the people who are being targeted. So the, the fraudsters are really very good. And I think it's it's key to start with, you're filtered, right? Before a fraudster starts to groom you, you are typically on your own. Um, you're typically looking for love. And those two things together really put you in a different state of mind. So we're looking at someone that maybe has gone through marriage, has had kids yes. and maybe faced something, a divorce or have been, has been widowed. And now we're looking to try and find new love. So and this new area of being online is a is a brand new world for them. Yes. Yes. And if you think, where do our people's social networks now? Oftentimes, if you're elderly, you may be using Facebook as a way to try to, to get help, right? You want that like, you want that, dop- right. that dopamine. And so people are very honest about some of the, the best, right? They, you know, they, they put up a really positive screen. Oh, I'm, you know, traveling in Bali this year, or, oh, I just had my honeymoon. Everything's wonderful and beautiful, right? Oh, I just got a promotion. But Facebook is also used for the inverse. When people are at their Mm. lowest, they'll post and they'll say, I'm really looking for help. I'm really looking for prayers. I could really use some friends who I haven't talked to in a while. Um, You could log on to Facebook right now and search for certain keywords and go through profiles and find someone who's at the lowest point in their life right now. (sighs) Okay, so I'm at the lowest point of my life. I have decided to go on to Facebook and reach out, right, to connect with someone for all the reasons mm-hmm. you described. What happens then in, in, in the case of a romance scam? I just want to try and see if we can isolate some kind of components that might make us safer online. The fraudster is not going to reach out then, right? But they will keep a list, right? And so they'll mm-hmm. know, hey, this particular person has just lost their husband. I'll circle back in three months. They'll make sure, see, are they looking for a relationship now? Are they a year later now? I think that's the other thing that people don't particularly understand about fraudsters. They treat this as a business. They are very professional at what they do. They spend a lot of time and effort, and the rewards are worth that. And so you you always think about cost-benefit analysis of of any business. And so a a fraudster is willing to very much say, I have the list of 30 prospects. I'm going to see who has entered the dating market, say, six months, a year from now, have check-ins. I will then target them with particular content. Maybe this woman has posted favorably about the military. Maybe this woman has posted favorably about her um, nonprofit activity. Maybe this gentleman has posted about you know how much he misses um, his wife who had these type of characteristics. And so the fraudster will then tailor the profile, because these are fake people, right, to what they know mm. about the person. Um, they'll tailor their first message of, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a doctor working in an orphanage in Malaysia. And that might, to the particular person who's being scammed, sound like the best thing in the world, an angel who has come in and said, this is exactly the type of goodness that I need to see in the world. And so it's really preying on very specific, very personal ways to communicate from the, the fake profile to the person who is being groomed to scam. Yeah, it almost sounds like cult grooming. It is. It's very simple. Um, And even after they've been scammed, they don't want to admit it. No, this is my friend. No, this. And so it's it's really quite tragic. So even our numbers, the numbers that you guys have collated are probably low because people are, you know, 100 percent. Right. Right. 100 percent. Yes. Does this normally happen more to women or to men? Is there any gender information you guys have? Definitely that women tend to be more targeted. I, the FTC, all of the scammer pronouns are, are female pronouns and all of the scam 
pronouns are, are male. Um, and so it's it's quite interesting that they've chosen to do that either consciously or subconsciously. Do you have tips or ideas on what red flags are to help us navigate these waters that seem to get more and more dangerous every year? Yes. So the single best thing that you can do that I don't feel gets emphasized enough is to freeze your credit and freeze the credit of your parents. That is hmm. definitely the best thing you can do. If you think about all of the other types of ways to send money, that has its own piece, right? I think that the fraudsters are moving away from that. And what they're now attacking are loan applications, credit cards, and those types of things, all of which ultimately, um, if you have locked your credit, then that will solve probably 70% of the problem. What these wow. scammers were doing yeah. is they were getting information, sensitive information about their targets, and then opening new credit cards in their name, moving the real credit cards that they have stolen from someone else to the billing and delivery address of their sweetheart. And then that allowed them to skate through all of the traditional fraud review. So that's the single best thing that you can do that is fairly easy and straightforward. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. It makes perfect sense, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. shout it from the mountaintops. I will. I will. I'm on you. I'm on. I'm on that side. Per definitely. <laughs> per perfect. So the next thing is obviously we can't stop people from dating online or finding love online. Right. If you do a reverse image search of someone that you've met and you find that they have a presence across the web with different names, it's a huge red flag. The problem is that's not an easy thing to do for, you know, an 80 year old woman who's just now trying to, to find someone to talk to. Trying to do a reverse image search is, is pretty difficult. So hopefully you can look out for those people in your life that are looking online and kind of teach them how to do it and show them and take them through an example of someone who has who has used a fake image. Right, right. That's good advice. Yeah. The next thing is absolutely don't take the conversation out of the app until probably three months in. And so what the fraudsters will do is they'll say, oh, I don't want to talk in this dating app anymore. Let's go to email. Let's go to WhatsApp. Let's go to text. The only reason that they're doing these type of attacks is because it's successful, right? The fact that the FTC and the FBI know about these, to your point earlier, means that the, the fraudsters are making a lot of money on this. And so it's worth paying attention to um, and it's worth respecting that they know what they're doing because they're following the money. If you kind of start getting that feeling of red flags are popping up everywhere, I need to extricate myself from this situation, this person I'm talking with online. Are you saying let's do that respectfully and just bow out slowly, freeze your credit? Yeah, I think that in general, the, the fraudsters need to be respected and not dismissed. I think one of the things that people really do is they think, oh, this is someone who's just a terrible human being, or oh, this is someone who's really dumb, like, why are they a fraudster? And I think we have to realize that these are human beings with an agenda, and this is their job, and they are quite good at it, and they spend a lot of time testing. And so the only reason that they're doing these type of attacks is because it's successful, right? The fact that the FTC and the FBI know about these means that the, the fraudsters are making a lot of money on this. And so it's worth paying attention to, um, and it's worth respecting that they know what they're doing because they're following the money. Bennett, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It's been fascinating. All you love seekers out there, I hope you remember to manage the swoon factor enough so that you can actually see these red flags. This was Carol Terrio for Hacking Humans. Joe, what do you think? You know, Dave, I find that interview a little bit disheartening, a little bit sad. Um, yeah. But I want to go over some points here. You know, my kids, both their current significant others, they met online. They have met through dating apps. You know, my daughter met her fiance through a dating app. My son has met the girl he's currently dating and the, the last girl he dated through dating apps. It, it's just how people do things now. Right. They're going after these older folks online and there are actually sites that cater to that demographic like ourtime.com. Oh, right? yeah. Which yeah. is a, a dating site for guys our age, Dave. Speak for yourself, <laughs> Grandpa. <laughs> I think an important point here when, when they're talking about social media and they brought up the point that you can see people at their best and at their worst. Right. A saying that I find helpful for putting social media in perspective is that in places like Facebook, you are comparing your behind the scenes 
to everyone else's highlights reel. Right. So everyone else, you see their great vacation and their kids are graduating from college and they just got a new job and a new car and a new outfit and a new puppy. Right. And meanwhile, you're home sick with the flu and your hair doesn't work and your shoes don't fit and your car broke down and <laughs> you can't my, afford to take the vacation you want. Does right? my new puppy upset you, Dave? <laughs> 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 anyway, um, uh, I, th I think it's interesting when he talks about Facebook that they're actually essentially doing lead generation on Facebook, mm -hmm. right? They're looking at people who are saying my spouse just passed away or I just got divorced and that they don't come back to that person right away or don't, yeah. don't come to that person. They come back in three months and then they follow that up with one to three years of pretexting. Well, you know, it reminds me in the old days before these online tools, you would hear about scammers would look through the obituaries right. to try to, to find widows mm -hmm. and they would try to scam them. That, that was how they generated their lead. Someone just died. So let me call up the widow and try to get some of that insurance money. Right. I like what uh, Jay says about protecting yourself, freeze your credit. They're not trying to bilk you out of money anymore. He said 70% of the time they're performing identity theft. If they get enough personal identification information from you then they can just fill out credit card applications in your name and have them sent to another address, but the billing can be sent to your address. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, now you might be on the hook for it. Of course, it's fraudulent, and, you, and these credit card companies, you may not have to pay them. I don't know how that works. I've yeah. never had to go through that yet. <laughs> um, reverse image search is also helpful. We've talked about that here, but he's right. How do you get your 80-year-old mom or grandmom to do a reverse image search. Mm -hmm. I like what he says, don't take the conversations out of the app, especially, he says, not for three months. I'm imagining that after three months, if the account is a scam account, it will be shut down by these dating sites. Mm -hmm. But we've also had stories on here before where dating sites aren't shutting down these scam accounts because it's against their own financial interests. Right. Here's my suggestion. Try to date locally and then Try to meet the person to make sure that they're real. Have that meeting in a public place. Like, mm -hmm. let's get together for coffee over at the uh, local coffee shop mm -hmm. and take an Uber there, mm -hmm. right? Don't drive mm -hmm. your car. Take an Uber. Hmm. Then get out of the car and sit down. And then when your ride gets there, just walk to the car and, and drive off. I think that's a good operationally secure way to meet somebody in person and verify their existence. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's tough, isn't it? I'm just so out of touch with all of this. It's been yeah. so long <laughs> since yeah. I had to deal you with any of this. I have never had to do online dating. Right, right. So the people I dated were people I already knew from right. school or college or work. or So there, this wasn't meeting people out of the blue. They were sort of pre-vetted because they were at school or they were at work or, you know, yep. they, they weren't dropping in from out of the blue. On the one side, it makes it easier to find people, but on the other side, you, you have the possibility for being scammed like this. Exactly. You know, there's always the social anxiety of walking up to somebody that you know and saying, hey, you want to go get a cup of coffee sometime or you want to go have dinner sometime? And if someone you just met, you don't know if they're in a relationship or not. At least when you're dating online, there's a very, I've, I've always seen the appeal of it because what you're doing is you're looking for people who who you know are looking for a relationship. Right, right. right. So, mm -hmm. but you're right. You're 100% correct. The, the scam that just makes you vulnerable to these scams. Jay was saying, have a healthy respect for these people. I mean, uh, they're, I don't know. I, I find these people despicable people. Yeah, I guess have a respect for their capabilities. Correct, is, is I would say that. Say yeah, it, that respect that like you respect a weapon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Every gun should be considered a loaded gun. Exactly, right? absolutely. Yeah. All right, thanks to Carol Terrio for uh, bringing us this story, and uh, thanks to Bennett for doing the interview. It's good information. And thanks to all of you for listening, and of course we want to thank our sponsors at Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of knowbefore for your security training. Thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.